to everybody for the second lecture in the Lionel Robbins series. And uh, I'm delighted to welcome back Angus Deaton from the University of Princeton, who's going to deliver the second lecture. All those of you who were here yesterday, I, was, I hope most of you were, would be enthralled by the uh, things that he was saying. And I, I'm hoping for a uh, repeat performance tonight. So without further ado, over to you, Angus, getting prices right. Thank you very much. It sounds like the microphone is working. Is that, yeah, you can hear me at the back? Um, very good. So today I'm going to talk mostly about prices. And then tomorrow I'm going to go back to poverty and inequality. Um, and you will see why I have to do this and how it hangs together as I go. Now, yesterday I talked about the, both the US and India and how the poverty lines were originally set. Um, originally with reference to some more or less unsatisfactory or more or less satisfactory, depending how you look at these things, um, relationship to food and hunger. And then they were held constant in real terms. So they really haven't been changed at all in either, in, well, in the US at least, whereas in India you saw these periodic convulsive um, changes from time to time. But of course, you can't just hold it constant. You have to update it with the price level um, because if you had a poverty line set in 1963, if you're going to use it in 2014, you need its current value today. And so it has to be updated um, using some form of consumer price index. Now, of course, you don't have to do it this way. And the EU and the at-risk of poverty lines, which are set as a fraction of median income or a fraction of mean income, don't require any price um, adjustment of that sort. And that could be thought of to be a considerable advantage of those indices for reasons we'll see as we go. Um, on the other hand, um, let's stick with an absolute poverty line right now, and we need to update it in money terms. Now, of course, consumer price indices play an enormous role in measurement in the economy way beyond um, poverty. Almost all of our measures of real growth in the economy, um, GDP for example, um, are dependent on the way that we measure um, prices. Um, without prices, we can't really make any comparisons of living standards over time, like are we richer now than we were 20 years ago, or over space, are we richer than the French, or are the French richer than the Americans, or whatever. Um, and yet, these indices, which are sort of very elementary economic things, I mean, and that economists have been making these at least since Jevons um, 150 years ago, um, they're controversial still, both technically on the part of economics and politically. And unlike today, yesterday's lecture, where I was mostly talking about politics destroying indexes, I think, or politics destroying measurements, I think what's happening, what I'll argue here, is the main flaw here lies in the economic theory more than in the um, politics of this. The politics is very heavily involved. So let me start with the wonderful story of the Boskin Commission, um, which many of you will know about. So the Senate Finance Committee, under Republican control, um, set up an advisory committee to study the consumer price index in June 1995. Now, th the way the Senate works in Washington is if the Republicans have overall control, then on each committee they would have control. Similarly, if the Democrats are in control, in each committee they would have control. So these committees can do things even though all the people of the other party dissent. Um, and this was a Republican committee that set up this advisory panel. And the chair of it, uh, Michael Boskin, um, had been the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors um, for President George H.W. Bush, the first Bush. So he was a Republican. He'd been a Republican appointee, and he'd worked for a Republican president. Now, what started, why was this commission appointed? It was appointed. The, the story starts with work by Dave Lebo and his colleagues at the Federal Reserve Board. And they'd done some work on the consumer price index. And they'd argued in a paper that the consumer price index was rising too rapidly. It was overstating the rate of inflation in the economy. And they argued it was doing so by about one percentage point a year. 
so it doesn't sound all that much, but it's saying if inflation was 5%, the real inflation rate was only 4%. And somehow the official statistics from the Bureau of Labor Statistics were getting this wrong and overstating this. Now, they argued that the reason that was happening was three separate things. Um, one is a concept called substitution bias, which those of you who are of economists will have learned in elementary price theory. And this is to do with the fact that as relative prices change in the economy, um, people adapt what they buy to the changing relative prices. They take advantage of the relative prices. And that's not built into the index because the index is, it's a very complicated thing, but it's essentially based on a fixed bundle of goods. And that doesn't take account of that. And they also argued that new goods were not being properly allowed and taken care of, and that the improvements in existing goods were not really being taken care of either. So that was what Dave Lebo at Al had argued. And then Alan Greenspan, who was of course chairman of the Federal Reserve at that point, who had to regularly testify in front of Congress, went to the House of Representatives for one of these regular sessions, and he passed on this information. Um, he told the Congress that according to his researchers, the consumer price index was rising too fast and inflation was actually less than we thought it was. That set off an enormous firestorm. Now, this is the era of Newt Gingrich. Sometimes the era of Newt Gingrich never seems to have gone away. <laughs> but at that point, Newt Gingrich was Speaker of the House um, and was in budget cutting mode. I mean, it sounds like today's mode too. And he said, the Bureau of Labor Statistics has six weeks to fix this, otherwise I'm gonna zero them out. A very famous phrase at the time. Zero them out meant in the next budget, there would be no Bureau of Labor Statistics. And all these guys would lose their jobs unless they fixed this toot sweet, as it were. Well, why is he so keen on this? You know, it's just a number out there. Well, of course, and you'll see more in this in a minute. But a lot of it's to do with what I talked about yesterday, which is this sort of Weberian rationalization that's carried out through indexation. So Social Security payments, which are a major charge on the federal government, are indexed on the consumer price index. So if the consumer price index is going up too fast, those old people, these wretched, greedy old people, are getting much more than they're supposed to get, and they're ruining the country sort of idea. But of course, that's true for income taxes, it's true for food stamps, and there's a whole bunch of other items that are tied indexed to the CPI. And so if the BLS was overstating this, the federal government was being artificial, the federal deficit was being artificially inflated, and Newt Gingrich wanted that fixed very quickly. Okay, so there are a bunch of other economists at the same time making more or less um, strong arguments about the same thing. There's a very famous paper by Jerry Hausman, um, written no doubt under a consultancy contract, which claimed that the introduction of apple cinnamon Cheerios, and that alone, I don't even know what these things are, but I'm sure they're very good for you, <laughs> of apple cinnamon Cheerios alone, it's a breakfast cereal, anyway. It sounds like it might be something else, but it's a breakfast cereal. Um, added $78 million to consumer welfare. It's about $200 million um, at current prices. Um, and that public paper caused a huge storm of controversy. Um, it's done in a very clever way. Um, and because you might ask, well, what were consumers doing before these really important things came along? Well, the answer, of course, in the way that Jerry modeled it, was to say, well, effectively, the price was infinite. And with an infinite price, they couldn't buy these things. Suddenly, they came to a finite price. And so you can calculate the consumer welfare associated with this reduction in price. And that's what he did. And of course, you have to make a lot of assumptions along the way. And a lot of those assumptions were heavily disbelieved um, by most economists in the profession. This is, this is sort of amusing footnote. He made a somewhat less amusing claim, also attacking the BLS very heavily, that they'd forgotten to put <laughs> cell phones in the consumer price index. And cell phones are, of course, an item whose price was falling very rapidly. Now, of course, remember, this is 1995, not 2014. And no one had a cell phone in or 1995. Of course, that's not true. But most of the cell phones in the US, which were somewhat more slow to adopt there than here, 
um, were business cell phones and shouldn't have been in the index anyway. But it sounded very good that the BLS somehow had not noticed that cell phones had come along and were not being taken into account. Bill Nordhaus wrote a very um, thoughtful paper, which many of you may know, about light and talked about the transitions from candlelight to the sort of lights we had today and how much that has made our lives better. And then he looked for how this technical improvement in light has taken account of in the national accounts and made a really good case that essentially was not taken account of at all that the new, goods, the new goods were built into the index in a way that didn't capture the benefits of these new indexes. So one question I want you to think about and I'll come back to is, okay, maybe life is better because we have these better lights, but is the CPI the right place to capture this? So I'll come back to that in a minute. So what did the Boskin Commission come up with? It claimed that a 1.1 percentage point a year overstatement of inflation was going on. So they actually upped the LIBO number from 1 percentage point a year to 1.1 percentage point a year. They combined the new goods and quality change into a single item, and that was most of it, um, 0.6 percentage points out of the 1.1 percentage points. Um, and they have some pretty dramatic statistics in that report that the fixing this would reduce the federal budget deficit by 629 billion over a decade. That's about 1.3 trillion um, in today's dollars. You know, as one American politician once said, you know, if you start talking about a billion here and a billion there, pretty soon you're talking about real money. Well, you know, here you're talking about 691 billion for a cutoff. They claimed that if this was not fixed, the bias would be the fourth largest federal outlay program, i.e. the government would be spending enormous amounts of money on a bias, meaning spending a lot of money on old people who shouldn't be getting it. Now, if you look at the details of that report, um, it's a really weird thing because most of us agree that this quality is there and not being properly picked up, but they just made up numbers. Um, you know, what my South African friends call a thumb suck. You know, where did you get that number from? They say, well, there's the number, you know. And I remember one paragraph that said, curtains are much better than curtains used to be. They don't go on fire so easily. Well, how much is that worth? Well, it's worth about 2% a year in the price of curtains. So that was the sort of way this argument was conducted. And many people find it just not very convincing at all. Um, nevertheless, this number is still used. Various people build it into their calculations. Um, if you read Mike Boskin's description, say on Project Syndicate, for instance, um, the major claim he makes for himself is that he found errors in the way the Bureau, Bureau of Labor Statistics was calculating the price index. Um, and in fact, as deficit, every time deficit reduction becomes an issue in Washington again, they talk about fixing it to some extent by using a different version of the CPI, which doesn't rise as rapidly. So this is still out there. So in the response to this, and this is echoes of what I talked about yesterday, they set up a National Academy of Panel to examine this issue as to how prices um, should be measured. And this panel basically noted the importance of quality change, but found no credible way of dealing with it. And again, I was on that panel. It, it, didn't, it wasn't like there was a huge amount of disagreement between left and right, with one side thinking that you had to fix it and the other one saying you don't. It was just simply that when people thought about it, except in a few extreme cases, they just didn't really know how to fix it. So the problem is real and intractable. It's very easy to accept that there's unmeasured quality change in the US, but not easy to measure it. And you can't imagine the Bureau of Labor, Labor Statistics or the Office of National Statistics here doing Heisman-type calculations to see how much they should reduce the price index because of iPads or new gadgets that come along. It's just totally nuts. Healthcare is perhaps one of the biggest items because there's been this huge increase in the prices um, of pe that people are paying for healthcare. But you know, maybe this is not this is actually quality. Healthcare is clearly better than it was 50 years ago, and maybe we're not capturing that. So one 
argument, and people have carried this in various ways, is to measure health care not by the inputs, the amount you pay to the doctors and nurses and the hospitals, but the effect on mortality rates. So what's the health care for? Is to keep us alive for longer. And Nordhaus again estimated that health improvements, if they were taken into account, would have doubled GDP growth in the 20th century. So all the growth in the 20th century would have been twice as large if we took into account the effects of mortality. So, and that's of course because when economists value life, they attach very large numbers to it, which are right or wrong. But nevertheless, this is a big deal and these are big numbers. So let's talk about mortality a little bit more and the cost of living adjustment. But the question really is how much of the mortality rate decline is actually due to behavioral change or background things like nutrition and how much of it is actually due to better health care? Because it's only the last that should be included in the accounts. Because if health care is getting very much more expensive but it's not doing anything for us, then that's pure price increase. Whereas if it's getting very much more expensive and it's saving our lives, then that should add to GDP in some sense. Now, the, some reasons for not thinking that you should do all that is that the US spends a huge amount on health care, more than any other country in the world as a share of GDP, but it's higher mortality and morbidity rates than Britain and nearly all other advanced countries. So we don't get for that money what you think you might get for money if there was some close relationship between the cost and its output. The other thing which came out in this sort of um, paper um, by Kevin Murphy and Topel, um, who actually calculated, should we actually have more health care? Um, now, I don't know this, but there's a lot of money coming from the pharmaceutical companies to finance studies um, <laughs> like this. So there's a lot of them out there. And this was one that calculated, it, there's a big component of the American economics profession who thinks that the U.S. should spend more on health care, not less on health care, because they say it's so incredibly valuable to prolong life that we should be spending even more on it. So these guys calculated, um, it, you know, how much was health care worth it? So they took all the cost of health care over the last 30, 40 years, they compared it with the increase in life expectancy, and it turned out that it was worth it for men but not for women, which presumably means we should have more health care for men and less health care for women. Now, of course, that's complete nonsense because the reason that life expectancy of women has not been rising very much is all to do with smoking and nothing to do with health care. Women were very late to take up smoking and have been very late to quit. And so women's life expectancy has been falling, has been rising much less rapidly than men's life expectancy, and that's what's driving the result. But what this tells you is just, it's not clear. You know, even if we wanted to make some allowance for the quality of healthcare, we've no idea how much of this to attribute to the healthcare system. So we don't really know how to do this. And generally, should we really have a price index that's a true cost of living index number? You know, Konyus, the Russian economist and mathematician in the 1920s, wrote a paper explaining how to calculate the cost of living index number in terms of utility theory. But that's what this logic would say. How about cold weather? You know, in Edinburgh, it costs more to heat a house than it does in London, um, even if prices are all the same. So would we really want to say that the price level in Edinburgh was higher <coughs> than the price level in London? I don't think so. How about if you like to think about sex in this context, how about the contraceptive pill? How about Viagra? Viagra increased people's life standards, living standards, made people better off. Um, so did the contraceptive pill. Is the right way to account for that to reduce the price level? That's what Nordhaus and people would argue, that this has been an increase in well-being, that we're not taking it into account in the national accounts, and we should do so by adjusting the price index. Most of us find that very hard to accept. But you know, I don't have an answer to this.
And this is what I said at the beginning, uh, but I think this is sort of a failure of economics, that there's all this quality change going on, all these iPads, all these things that are changing our lives, email and so on. It's not properly incurred in the economics, in the national accounts, um, but is it the right way? Is it to reduce the price level? So that's where we are right now, I think. Let me talk a little bit about the consequences. I've already said that a wide range of indicators are very important. Um, the one way that's argued on the right is that this famous finding that median wages in the United States are changing um, very little. Um, if you're in the bottom 20%, your median real wages have fallen. And they say, well, they haven't really fallen because you're not taking into account um, all these iPads and iPhones and emails and all these nice things that people have. Um, they're not properly taken account of in their living standards. So actually these people are doing okay. And it's hard not to believe there's some truth to that argument, but of course it's a very strong argument coming from one side of the political spectrum saying we don't have to worry too much about poverty rates or about income distribution because these people are actually doing much better than we think they are. Um, so I've talked already about social security indexation, the income tax brackets, the ties to the poverty line. There's a very nice book by the political scientist Thomas Stapleford on the cost of living in America. And he has this very wise sentence, I think, which he says, how and why did we come to this strange place where extraordinary sums of money, you know, the fourth largest federal outlay, change hands based on small movements in a controversial and admittedly ambiguous statistic such as the consumer price index. And that's because once you've indexed, you're in the hands of this and the statisticians set this and it has huge consequences um, for the way that money is handed around um, in society. And I do think the underlying failure here is, you know, um, Richard belated me a little yesterday and said, tell us how you would want to do this. And he said, tomorrow, I said, tomorrow when I talk about global poverty, I'll tell you how the line ought to be set, and I will tell you that. But I don't know how to deal with this. And I think there's just this big hole in the way we're accounting for consumer welfare. Now, if I were as confident as Richard is about the ability of happiness statistics or well-being statistics, you might have some chance of picking that up this way, but I don't think we're there yet. Um, but that's a possible usefulness. Um, of these numbers. If we were to go back to the poverty line and fix the CPI as Boskin suggests, we are in fact winning the war on poverty. And there's a paper by Mayer um, and Sullivan, um, Bruce Mayer, Dan Sullivan, um, which shows the, the blue line here is the line I showed you yesterday, um, <coughs> which is the official poverty rate, which remember fell at the beginning um, around to 1970, and then basically there's nothing very much happened to it since. It's gone up and down with the business cycle, um, but otherwise has not changed very much. Now, what Mayor and Sullivan did was they did two things. They adjusted the line for, they adjusted resources to take it after tax, so the safety net kicks in, but they also used the Boskin adjustment to the price index, um, which is basically making the price index go up by 1.1% a year, later smaller than it otherwise would. What we saw yesterday was that the after-tax movement had a little effect, but not a huge effect. So the big difference between the red line and the blue line here is making the Boskin adjustment. So if you're prepared to take the Boskin adjustment, we are winning the, the war on poverty in the United States, and there's been a big reduction um, in the poverty rate, unlike the official statistics, which show none. So if your primary focus is on poverty, this, once again, is really a big deal. So what I want to sing you into is talking about prices over space. Um, for many people, when they first see it, it's perhaps surprising that the U.S. makes no allowance um, for different price levels in different places. So it's clear that New York City is a lot more expensive than Mississippi, um, for example, but there's no official recognition of that in the U.S. statistics. And in fact, until a few months ago, they didn't even compute any such indices, let alone use them for anything. So a few months ago, they actually calculated indexes. The Bureau of Economic Analysis, which is the thing that does the national accounts, 
um, actually calculated price indices for different areas of the United States, different cities, different states, um, and so on. And as you might expect, um, there are some large differences. So the New York City, New, New York, New Jersey metropolitan area, sort of where I live, has price levels that are about 50% higher than the poorest metropolitan area, or at least the lowest price metropolitan in the area in the United States, which is Rome in Georgia. Um, and um, that's about as big a difference as there are between cities. What you might expect is true. Much of it's housing. Um, housing is much more expensive in New York than in Rome. Um, but it gets into other things too, because of course it's not really housing, it's land prices, and that gets into rents, and it gets into delivery costs, and supermarket costs, and all sorts of other things. So there are actually quite substantial price differences in all categories. The other thing in the United States that's perhaps somewhat surprising is there are big differences in petrol prices across different states, depending on how far you are away from a refinery. So actually, New Jersey is a very cheap place, and Texas is very cheap, but North Dakota, where they're finding all this oil, is very expensive because they refine it somewhere else. So these numbers could be incorporated into the poverty statistics. And you could say that money goes much further in Rome, Georgia, than it goes in New York City, and many people think of that as the obvious way to do it. But there's actually a counter-argument, counter which has been quite vociferously put forward, which says that, okay, if you're so much better off um, in Rome, Georgia, than you are in New York, and you're living in New York, why the hell don't you get out of New York and move to Rome, Georgia? There's free mobility in the United States. You get on your bike, to use a famous phrase from British politics a long time ago. Um, and you know, if you're unhappy here, go there. Um, where it's cheaper. So why are there people living in New York in spite of it being very expensive? And the answer, the standard answer is there are higher amenities in New York. There's all the opera and all the shows and all the restaurants, whereas in Rome, Georgia, remember we're talking about Rome, Georgia, not Rome, Italy. Um, <laughs> you know, there's not a lot to do to entertain yourself and so, you know, that, and that's why prices are higher in New York, because people want to live there and they're prepared to pay more. Well, if that argument is true, you shouldn't be correcting these things for prices, um, because you'd be double counting. They've already got the benefit of the place, so you shouldn't give them even more. Of course, the problem here is maybe the poor are not very mobile. Um, maybe the poor don't get the amenities. Um, the amenities may be largely enjoyed by the wealthy. So when you're taking poverty into account, that's not the right way to do it. Um, I spend a month in Montana every summer where people are really quite poor, and we say it's so spectacularly beautiful here, and the usual response is, you can't eat the scenery. You know, there are these beautiful mountains, but it doesn't help you put food um, on the table. Um, for what it's worth, if you do a regression of life evaluation or happiness on log income and the log of this price, you get equal and opposite signs. So these price levels do seem to reduce people's reported well-being, which suggests they can't be all amenities, at least conditional on income. Okay. Um, another thing you might ask is if there are these price differences over the U.S., maybe we're overstating inequality. The answer is hardly at all, because most inequality in the U.S. is within um, cities and within states, and not really between them at all. So it doesn't do very much of that. Nevertheless, if I can refer back to yesterday in India, it's taken as axiomatic that spatial price indices will be used. And there are urban, rural price indices. As we'll see tomorrow, the World Bank adjusts its global poverty counts for price differences within large countries, not just between countries. Um, and, you know, so even if the US doesn't do it, other countries um, really do it on a wide scale. However, my major topic here is not spatial price indices within countries, but how to measure price levels across countries, and how to make purchasing power parity corrections um, between different countries. So let me talk about that. Here's some of the motivation. I mean, here are some of the big global questions that people who are interested in these talk about. Who in the world is poor and who is rich? How many poor people are there in the world? How can we measure progress on income poverty in the world? How do the poor live? What is it really life is what is life really like in the poorest places 
um, in the world. Can we just convert using exchange rates or do we have to do something else? How big are the differences between people? I mean, what's the ratio of per capita income in America to per capita income in India? Are we five times better off, 10 times better off, 50 times better off? We don't know. What about China? Is Chinese econo China's economy bigger or smaller than America's? That's an issue that's had a lot of attention in the press recently. It's not entirely clear to me why people care about that, but they do. I mean, it was the sort of headline in the Financial Times when this happened that China had beaten America and was bigger than America. The Chinese certainly worry about it an enormous amount, <coughs> and I don't know why. It's just a fact. Um, are Africans better off or worse off than South Asians? So what about the global distribution of income over countries? You know, some countries have low per capita income and others have high. What about over all the citizens of the world? You take all the people in the world, um, what does the distribution of income over them look like? Is it getting worse or is it getting less? And is global inequality narrowing or widening? Now, I'm going to try to answer those questions tomorrow. Um, but what I want to talk about today for the rest of today is how we make these purchasing power corrections across countries um, and the difficulties and strengths and how we go about trying to do that. All answers to all of these questions require spatial price indices. So let's think about this. How much does it cost to live in India compared with the US or Britain? Now, the first thing you could think of is let's use the exchange rates. You know, if you get on an airplane and fly to Delhi, um, you change your pound, you'll get, what, nearly 100 rupees um, for that. You have 100 rupees to spend in <coughs> Delhi. Um, does that buy more or less than the pound would spend in, um, a pound would buy you in England? Now, what happens is the exchange rates do very, very badly in that sort of comparison. So if any of you have ever done it, with respect to India or some other country in the world, you'll know that the pound, when it's changed into rupees, goes much further than it would if you spent it here. And in fact, the difference is huge. So the pound will buy about three times as much on average in India as it will buy here. So if you use the exchange here, you're out by a factor of three. So this is not like a 10% adjustment or a 5% adjustment or some minor thing. This is a huge thing that has to be taken into account. Now, economists sort of understand why this happens. There's a theorem called the Balassa-Samuelson theorem that says that countries with low productivity and traded goods will have low price levels. So I just put that there as a marker for um, those of you who think, well, how can this happen? Um, how can food be so much cheaper in Delhi what about the law of one price? What about arbitrage? Well, the trouble is this cheap meal in Delhi is in Delhi. It's not in London. And by the time you got it to London, it would be <laughs> useless. You couldn't eat it. The guy who can give you a cheap haircut in Delhi is in Delhi. He's not in London. <coughs> he can't get to London. He's not allowed to come to London. So those differences in price can be maintained um, for a very long time. Let me show you a picture of this. This comes from the latest data, which are just a few months old. Um, this shows the log of GDP per capita along the horizontal axis. On the vertical axis is this ratio I've been talking about, um, which is the ratio of local prices to the exchange rate. So it's like a price level. If this is one, you basically get the same for your pound in the country as you do um, in the US, at least. The US is the numerator here. If it's below one, it's a bargain in those countries. They have low price levels. If it's above one, they have very high or higher price levels than the US. So here's real GDP per head along the bottom. The circles is always um, the area of the circles proportion to population. So you can see in India and China, the two big countries there. The two big ones at the bottom here are DRC and Ethiopia. And there up at the top is the USA, which sits astride the line of one, because it's defined that way. Um, I've shaded the UK in red, um, so you can see the UK, where the price level in the UK is a little bit higher um, than it is in the US. So if I change my dollars into pounds, I get less for them than I would if I spent them at home um, in New York. And of course, if I change my dollars into yen, 
um, or I went to Norway or Switzerland, I'd get completely hammered because those places are very expensive. Um, indeed. So this is actually giving you this curve, and you can see there's a very strong systematic relationship um, between the poverty of a country, how poor it is, the low GDP, and how much of a bargain it is um, to go there. I mean, this presumably was true across Europe once upon a time. You know, if you read Victorian novels, um, when really bad things happen to people in Britain in Victorian novels, they move to France to live, right? Because you can live respectably in France on about half what it costs to live in Britain in those days. So if you're disgraced, I think the other reason was people went when they were disgraced, right? It wasn't they didn't have any money, it's just you couldn't face your peers anymore. Okay, so here are these purchasing parity parities. So where did those come from? How do you get those numbers? I mean, I've shown you all these numbers, but where do they come from? And you can't just read them off the exchange rates. There's no choice but to get out there and actually calculate um, these um, numbers. I think I said almost all of this. Um, that's the price level for India. The exchange rate in 2013 was 58.6 rupees to the dollar. And the PPP rate for consumption was 17.5. So it's 0.3 of the total. So you get one, you get, you know, that's, that's how far it goes. Um, the PPP is a price index that compares the cost of consumption in India relative to the US. It has units that just like an exchange rate. It's not, we, we tend to think of indexes as being numbers like 1.5 to say price have gone up by 50% or something like that. But this actually has dimensions. It's rupees per dollar, it's like an exchange rate, but it's the exchange rate that would make the cost of living the same in both countries. So this PPP, as you can see here, is much lower um, than the official exchange rate. So these numbers all come from the International Comparison Program, or the ICP for short. So let me tell you a little bit about how this is set up, um, because again, this is an important part of the story for the politics and how this thing is set up. So I think of it as sort of like the Olympic Games. You know, the Olympic Games now meets every four years. Um, but it used to be a very irregular event, and only a few people showed up. Um, they were all very amateurs. Do you remember the chariots of fire, where those guys were winning the hurdles while smoking cigarettes and things? You know, they, were, they, they didn't really train very seriously. Um, so the first guys who started this were very amateur, but very far-sighted and very visionary that it was possible to do this. They went and collected prices in a whole bunch of countries around the world. Over time, it's been professionalized. There's lots of training. These people have got a lot of specialized training. They know what they're doing. There have been huge improvements in technique and huge increase in the number of countries participating. I'll give you some of these numbers later. Um, notice that you say, OK, why do we just care so much about prices? We're more concerned about comparing GDP across countries or average consumption across countries. Well, that's where the GDP and PPP numbers come from. Because you think of India, it publishes its national accounts. It tells you what its GDP per capita is in rupees per capita. So what is that really worth in international purchasing units? Well, you divide it by the PPP in order to get a real GDP in international dollars. So all of these numbers, for those of you who use the Penn World Table, or any numbers like that, or journalists, or lots of people, academics, policymakers, talk about the real size of economies, and that's price-adjusted size of economies, and that's all done using these PPP numbers. So the exercise is to like, collect prices, but the output of this is the quantities, the real magnitudes of these economies. Um, when it first started in the 60s and 70s, it was started at the University of Pennsylvania with help from the United Nations and support from foundations. Um, Irv Kravis, um, Robert Summers, Larry Summers' his father, um, and Alan Heston were really the three people who really started this. Alan Heston is 80 odd years old and is still working hard on this and doing wonderful um, work on it. There were only six countries when they first did it in 1967. They added four more in 1970. They only had a fairly small number of goods and services where they collect prices on it. It's a big effort, this. I mean, you're collecting millions and millions of prices around the world. And this was extended to other countries using interpolation. So, you know, if you have a graph like this, 
and you have a few countries, you can fill in the others by sort of joining the line. And that's what they did. And a paper published in the Economic Journal in 1978 had data for 100 um, countries. By the time we get to the modern area, which really starts with 2005, there were 146 countries. Um, the latest, which was published earlier this year, was for 2011 and had 199 countries around the world. The latest two rounds were housed in the World Bank Global offices with regional offices around the world that did the actual price collection. And the publication tends to come out about three years after the target year. Now, you might be interested, is this just a, it started out as an academic project with this, you know, UN involvement. Um, it's basically governed by the international statistical community, which is an important thing about it. It has an executive board, which is mostly chief statisticians of various countries around the world. And it's chaired by Martine Durand, who's the chief statistician of the OECD. It's guided by a technical advisory group, of which I'm a member. Um, and those are mostly national account statisticians, academics, and technical experts. So for instance, housing is a really hard thing to measure. Construction is a hard thing to measure. So we bring in guys who know how to build a house, and they know what goes into building a house and all the materials. And so they do a lot of stuff like that. It's housed under contract in the World Bank, who appoints a global manager, technical and support staff, and it's owned collectively by the international statistical community, not by the World Bank, even though the numbers are published by the World Bank, nor is it owned by a small group of people who have produced the statistic, which is the case for the World Bank dollar a day poverty line. And of course, there's been huge technical progress in this over time, but it should not disguise the fundamental difficulties of doing this. And I want to show you a little bit about why this is hard. It's just inherently difficult to make price comparisons across countries. And to me, the deepest problem here is, again, a quality-related problem. The goods that are representative are rarely comparable across countries, and goods that are comparable are rarely representative. So you have a choice between defining something very narrowly the example would be a Brooks Brothers Oxford cotton button-down shirt, for instance. You know exactly what that is. You go find it in a store in Britain. You can find a store in the US. But it's really hard to find in Cameroon um, or in Senegal. Or you can just say a shirt, OK? The trouble is, if you just say a shirt, they'll probably get a Brooks Brothers shirt in the US. But they get some Chinese-made rayon t-shirt that people are wearing in Africa, for instance. So you're not comparing like with like. And it's really a quality issue here. Um, and holding that quality inch is very hard. And if you hold quality constant, you're not going to compare what people actually consume. And if you compare with what people actually consume, you're not <coughs> holding quality right. So there's this sort of scylla of precision on the one hand in which you make very precise what you want. But that overstates prices in poor countries, because these Brooks Brothers shirts exist in those countries, but not in the shops that normal people use. Similarly, if you have breadth, like the shirt, you understate poor country prices, and you get it wrong in the other direction. And the ICP has wrestled with this ever since its beginning, and has taken different stands on these in different Rhymes. It gets even worse if there's non-overlapping consumption patterns. So if you imagine someone in Brazil who lives on rice and beans and someone else who lives on wheat in northern India, and they have nothing overlapping in their consumption pattern, you really have no basis for making a comparison between them at all. On top of that, there's a whole bunch of goods like housing, education, construction, government services, and healthcare, all of which are really, really difficult. I mean, if you have something like a pound of rice, you sort of know what it is. It has quantities and it has a price. But for all those things, it's very hard to come up with those. The coverage um, up to 1993 were of much lower quality with lots of imputations. Many countries had never participated. This is something most people don't know. Until 2005, China was not in there. So these numbers you know, just didn't cover the largest and potentially most important country in the world. And India had not participated since 1978, almost 30 years before. 
2005 and 11 were much higher quality. They included China, India, large numbers of new countries, um, especially in Africa. And of course, these improvements, it's great to do better, but that tends to make them non-comparable with earlier rounds. Tell you a little bit about the geopolitical issues. China, for whatever reason, takes a very, very strong political, stand, political interest in the outcomes. And for whatever reason, and people in this room may know this better than I am, they want to exaggerate their price level. Um, and the story goes, and I don't know this for sure, but the story is that in the early rounds, the Chinese wanted the ICP to calculate everybody other's country's prices and then show them to the Chinese, and the Chinese would tell them what their prices were. Um, so sensitive are the Chinese to their position in the world. Um, they very much wanted to delay the date when the Chinese economy was bigger than the US economy. Um, if, of course, they exaggerate their price level, it does also exaggerate Indian poverty because it makes India, China um, poorer, which is something they don't want. Um, sometimes it's argued that higher price levels reduce US pressure to allow appreciation of the yuan, but I don't really understand that either. Um, and as someone who sat on these technical committees seeing these data coming in, it's very difficult to find out exactly how the Chinese data were collected. They change mysteriously. All sorts of <coughs> bad things happen. So that's one of the big political issues that underlies collection of these prices. The other one is that Eurostat has its own program, um, which is carefully regulated by law, and the ICP cannot change the relative PPPs between countries in the EC. So the EC has its own data for the PPP GDP of the US, not the US, of um, France versus Germany or France versus whatever, and we're not allowed to change those. So those are treated as sacrosanct and they're fixed. And those numbers, of course, are very carefully regulated. These statisticians are very, very careful about what they do. And I said, otherwise, politics don't seem to be very central. Now, of course, it depends whether you count global politics as the setting of the Millennium Development Goals or the Sustainable Development Goals, which should be called from now on. And if you think those are important politically, these numbers are important for those. I will argue that they're not really important. There's a huge amount of uncertainty in these prices. And I wanted to argue that a little bit that these relative prices are different in different countries. And some goods that are very cheap in some places are very heavily consumed. For instance, if you live in a country that has a long coastline, fish tend to be cheap and people eat a lot of fish. That's no big surprise. It also works the other way. My favorite example is Marmite. Um, you know, I grew up in this country, and therefore I can't live without Marmite. Um, some of you will know that British people can't live without Marmite. Foreigners think this is the weirdest thing there's ever been. Um, it's four British pounds per pound in Sainsbury's, or on Sainsbury's website where I looked the other day. It's $20 per pound in my local um, supermarket. And so you can see that Marmite is a good whose relative price is incredibly expensive in the US. And that's presumably because only I and a few other people eat it. So they sell it in tiny little pots that are incredibly expensive. And it's not, Marmite's a byproduct of beer. Um, it's not so hard to make. It's produced under constant returns to scale. There's no reason at all why the price level should be different if the consumption were different. Let me take a more realistic example. So a any of you who have ever traveled in Africa will know that air travel in Africa is very, very expensive, especially by local living standards. It's true around the poor world, but especially in Africa. And of course, very little is consumed. Let's think about the UK versus an African country. In the UK, air travel is cheap and very heavily consumed. Um, I think it's about 6% of consumption expenditure in Britain is on air travel. So let's say we're comparing the UK and Kenya. So the price relative for air travel is very, very high, Kenya relative to the UK. Okay? Now we have to weight that together um, in an index. So we could either use Kenyan weights, and that would mean that this had very little effect because the Kenyans don't spend very much on air travel. So the high price of air travel in Kenya doesn't really matter. And Kenya would come out with a low price level and be a rich country. But if we use the UK weight, and remember this is a 
symmetric comparison between these two countries, the UK spends a lot on air travel. So if a British people had to face the Kenyan price for air travel, it would make the price level very high. That makes the Kenyan price level very high and makes Kenya very poor. Okay? So you might say, which of those is right? Well, the way that PPP solved that is by taking an average of those two numbers. Right? And of course, that's no solution at all. It's just you're faced with a problem and you say, well, is it this one or this one? Who knows? Let's average them. And that's what PPPs do. And it's not very satisfactory when relative prices are very different. Now, of course, what you might argue is that you're, this is air travel. It's only one example. What happens if you look at all prices together and average them? Is this a big problem? Well, sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. For those of you who've studied this, they'll know what I'm talking about here are Posh and Lesper's indices. Uh, Lesper's is home country weighted. That's like the British weights. The uh, Posh is like using the Kenyan weights. What about if we take all goods together? Well, if you take the US as a base in 2011, Liberia and Belize are the two extremes, and they have Lesper's indices that are more than double the Posh indices. And there's really no basis for choosing between those two things. Um, China and India are 15% and 41% higher. So that's something like the margin of uncertainty. If you look at France and Netherlands, who have economies that are very similar to the US, there's only about a 1% difference. So it's really very easy to measure the PPPs between similar countries and very difficult um, for very different countries. So we can actually use these ideas to develop a way of thinking about standard errors for PPPs. Um, and I'll show you some of those in a minute. I thought you might like to see some numbers. This is India, China, Kenya, and the UK. I did it all relative to the US here. So if you look in the far right column for the UK and look at the bottom right first, the exchange rate is 0.62. Now, I know you're mostly thinking you think of an exchange rate as dollars per pound. So this is the reciprocal of this. This is how much pounds you get for a dollar. And the exchange rate, you get about 60, this is in 2001, you got about 62 pence um, for your dollar. Um, the PPP for all goods together is about 0.76, which is telling you the price level in the UK is higher than the price level. You know, things are more expensive here once you convert it the exchange rate. If you look down the column, you can see these are PPPs for individual goods. So you can see rice is 0.65, which is about the exchange rate. It's a tradable good. That's what you would expect. Um, look at tobacco, for instance, is about twice. Very expensive because taxes here are much higher than they are in the US. Similarly, if you've got petrol, it's even higher still. It's 1.45 um, compared with 0.62. So petrol here is like double the price that you would be used to paying in the US, even once you've done the exchange rate conversion. Air travel is about average. Now, if you go to look at India and China, you can see, first of all, the PPPs are very much lower than the exchange rate, about a third for India and about a little more than a half um, for China, and somewhere in between for Kenya. Um, and if you look down these goods, which I don't have time to go through in detail, you'll see that the differences are not uniform across countries. The, what's expensive in one country is cheap in another country and vice versa. There's some standard patterns. So there's a lot of this difficulty going on that you've got just no very simple way of just looking at these numbers and seeing what these things are. So the standard errors are small for closely related countries. The US and Canada are perhaps around 5%. The margin of uncertainty for very different countries, perhaps 15 to 20% for India and China. And if you do really difficult comparisons, like compare Mali with Indonesia, or Ethiopia with Japan or China, then you really very little idea what you're doing. So here's my bottom line here in my sort of pessimistic mode. We just don't know very clearly what are the relative living standards in countries with very different structures. So let me just finish with talking about the implications of this. This was an enormous problem for measuring world poverty. So remember yesterday I talked about how you change the reporting periods in India and you could take 175 million people in and out of poverty. Well, the PPPs do exactly the same thing. The World Bank says a third of India's population live on less than $1.25 a day. So if the PPP is uncertain, say, plus or minus 20%, 
that takes the number of poor up or down by 180 million. So the difference between the up and down is 360 million people, um, which is 36% of all of global poverty, and that's only India. So if we're uncertain about these conversions, measuring global poverty is going to be a very imprecise business. And that's one of the things I'll elaborate on more um, things um, later. Now, each round, these rounds 85 to 93, 93 to 2005, there are big changes from one round to the other. Um, and much of this, I think, is driven by methodological change. Let me skip the next slide and show you a picture. So this picture, again, this is log of GDP per capita <coughs> along the horizontal axis. And what you've got up here is the comparison in all of these numbers are for 2005. And this is the ratio of the new price level to the old price level. So if it's at one here, which is mostly true for the rich countries, there's really no change at all. But in 2005, before the new round was done, they were projecting forward what these PPPs were based on the 93 numbers. The new numbers came along, and these are the ratios of those two things. Now, all you really need to understand here is this very strong downward slope. So that said, the measured price levels got way higher in poor countries and stayed pretty much where they were in rich countries. Remember, if the price level goes up, it makes the country poorer. These numbers are huge. They're clustering around two. So all of these countries in the middle of here became half as, their GDPs were cut by a half compared with what people thought they were. Now, of course, this is all relative to the US. So you could just as well say the US got twice as rich relative to Mozambique as we thought it before. So what this number did was it exploded world inequality by just an enormous number by the new measurements in 2005 relative to 1993. So we've had another round since then. This is 2011 relative to 2005, and this is for 2011. And you can see the relationship's not quite as tight now, but it slopes exactly the opposite way. So those countries that were all made poor in 2005 have now all been made rich again in 2011. So think of it as a giant concertina. When the new results came out for 2005, they made the world widely more unequal. And then when the new ones came in in 2011, they reversed a lot of that back again. This just shows the relationship between the two of them. But if you look, whole regions of the world um, were sort of moved around as a result of this. Africa, um, the price level for all of Africa together went up by 57%. Africa, so every country in Africa became 57% smaller, or you know. Asian Pacific, 46%, and so on. Eurostat hardly changed. And then in 2011, they went into reverse, and those countries got richer again. Remember, this is all relative to the US. So you could have done it all relative to India, and then the whole world would have got richer and then poorer again instead of poorer and then richer again. This is a relative effect, not any sort of absolute effect. Now, what happened, um, Bettina and Atten and I have some recent work that argues that the problem was with 2005, and that in 2011, it reversed the problems with 2005. And the real problem here is that you can measure within regions fairly easily, but you have to join up the regions at a final stage. And in 2005, um, they did that <coughs> with a special set of surveys. And I think this fell into the Brooks Brothers shirt problem that I was talking about before, that they had much too narrow categories. And the much too narrow categories overestimated the price level in most African countries and most Asian countries and caused this terrible contraction and increase in world inequality. In 2011, that method was not used. The goods were priced in all countries, and I think you get a truer read um, on what <coughs> happens. So poor countries got poorer relative to rich countries in the 2005 revision, or equivalently, rich countries got richer relative to poor countries. In 2011, poor countries got richer relative to rich countries in the 2011 revision, or rich countries got poorer relative to poor countries. China became almost as large as the US in 2011, much to their discomfort and surprise. 
And I think the big problem with China in the latest round was they were not anticipating this because they thought the 2005 ones would project. And of course, they suddenly got much richer than they thought they were going to be, and they were on the verge of being bigger than the US. So measured inequality went up and what went down. What happened to poverty is much more difficult, and I'll talk about it tomorrow. But both poverty and inequality will be my topics tomorrow. So let me just conclude with a couple of thoughts about the ICP. This is the penultimate slide. Um, most economists, or many economists, or perhaps most international economists or macroeconomists um, take data on PPPs and GDP um, through the Penn World Table, which is very, very heavily um, used in the profession. And what I'm telling you here tonight is those data are much shakier than you might think. And this is one of the great costs of being easily able to suck data from the internet. You know, you can get it down on your computer and you can be running regressions two minutes later. Well, you should read the stuff it says on there about how difficult some of those numbers are. Um, the linking of rounds is very hard. The conceptual difficulties, specific problems. And here's a health warning that is almost always ignored. No one should be using the pen world tables between rounds. Um, you should not treat this as a time series. Um, you should look at the benchmarks only. And there's some recent work showing that almost all of the papers in the literature that use the data between rounds fall apart once you replicate them on, try to replicate them on the next round of the data. And of course, with these ICPs jumping around from one round to another, because it's so hard to measure these things, and because of the methodological changes from one round to the other, um, this it gives you real difficulties with poverty lines. Because remember, as I showed yesterday, there's a lot of people live near these global poverty lines. So if you move them around a bit or you move the PPPs around, you just get enormous consequences for rural poverty. And of course, there's two things going wrong in here, which together put together this perfect storm of measurement difficulty, which is that you're using a headcount ratio cutoff around where there's a lot of people and you have a lot of uncertainty as to where the poverty line exactly is. There's some politics in this, but it's less severe if only because we do not live in a cosmopolitan world. Um, no one is ultimately responsible for measuring global poverty. Um, no one gets money depending on the numbers, and I will come back and talk about that tomorrow. So tomorrow I want to go back more to substance. I want to talk about global poverty, global inequality, and I want to take up some remarks of His Holiness the Pope, um, who issued an apost apostolic exhortation on global inequality and global poverty. And I want to use that as a sort of theme to talk about tomorrow. And I will, I promise Richard, say something about what I think ought to be done. OK? Thank you very much. Thank you, Angus, again, for a very stimulating uh, lecture. So we have some time for some uh, questions. So there's a roving mic. So uh, I'd ask you, if you, when you ask a question, to be uh, brief and to the point. So say who you are. There's a one at the back there. Uh, just briefly, thank you for a great lecture. Um, just in terms of future pricing, maybe 20, 30 years down the road with economic theory, yep. is it possible that one day we might have a common factor that could very accurately be used to determine prices? And I just give, give as an example, I know there's a lot of problems with this, but energy. Mm -hmm. So there's some physical economists bringing physics into economics who say it could be energy. There are obviously pro a lot of problems with that. But do you think that's a, a direction economics could go in? Well, I think economic, um, energy is a relatively easy thing to price because it's got units, you know, kilowatt hours and the price of that. It varies a lot because of countries, mostly because of taxation. Um, but there's a world energy market. <laughs> So that's actually one of the relatively easy things to do. And it's clear that if you're interested in climate change and you're working for the ICP or whatever, that's exactly what you ought to be doing. And for a lot of those purposes, you don't need the PPPs at all. 
I think for the other goods, the process of globalization certainly is going to make this easier over time because goods that used not to be traded are becoming more tradable. And as the China moves gets richer, it b begins to look more like the US and the other rich countries. So some of these problems go away. But it's always going to be hard, I think, to make comparisons for the US versus Africa, for instance. Um, the one thing that may be making that easier, and there's a lot of interesting work going on this, there are various projects that are using cell phones around the world to have people text back prices they pay for them. So this collection effort may get a lot easier. And if the cost of that comes down, we could do it every year instead of doing it every five years. And then these big breaks you get over five year periods would presumably get better. So I have some hope along that direction. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Johan. I'm a student here, master students. Um, so uh, I don't know, don't know if you're familiar with her work, but um, there's a Norwegian academic called Ingvild Almos, yeah. uh, who I know her work. Uh, has presented a critique against the pen world, ta uh, world table and, and tried to estimate the bias of, uh, of PPP estimation on the basis of um, projecting angle, uh, angles, yeah. curves. Yeah. Uh, so your comments on that? Um, she and I have been fighting over that for years. <laughs> I don't think that's I don't think that's a well-based thing to do. Um, I mean, it's it has a very powerful hold on people that the food share is a welfare indicator, um, and you know Engel thought that, and it was wrong when Engel thought it, and I think it's still wrong today. I mean, the problem is that there's no reason to suspect that when relative prices change, the food share will remain the same for people at the same well-being level. So there's no real good economic theory that says you can actually judge, um, well, this actually holds well-being constant, which is what you need. And in fact, there's an old theorem that goes back into the 70s, which explains exactly why that doesn't work. I mean, there is this thing that I mentioned when I, I was looking at Richard. Um, you know, the, the basic problem here is that we don't measure welfare directly. So, you know, if you directly, if you had credible happiness or well-being or life evaluation numbers for different countries, then you could do what Ingvild is trying to do, which is you could calculate the PPPs, which, you know, <laughs> you could adjust incomes by whatever price needed to be to make their happinesses equivalent, and then you could do that. And that's one of the great promises of the happiness data. I mean, if you can really do that, then lots of these measurement problems, which right now are very intractable, including the quality issues, um, could actually be addressed. So, you know, if people get all these iPads and iPods, I mean, you know, if you know what happens, the, the iPad gets invented, it takes off like wild, wildfire. People are very happy with it and they say their lives are better. And I think that's probably true. I mean, there are lots of inventions that don't make people's lives better. But I think this ability to communicate with people much more readily is a real boon to mankind. And yet when it's brought into GDP, they wait until it's been there a while, and then they bring it in when it's sort of reasonably well established. They <laughs> capture some of its price decline, which does show up, but the vast majority of the benefit is never really captured. And it's just in there. And then you're looking at its improvements over time, but you're not getting this once and for all oomph that you think it's done to living standards. And if you could actually measure people's well-being, and I'm right, that this is making people better off, and it comes through in the data, then you would actually be in a position to do better. And that's the great promise, but I think we're some way from implementing that yet. But I don't think the food share is a satisfactory way of doing that. Sure. And I haven't said anything to you that I haven't said to Ingvild. <laughs> yeah. Oops. Uh, another thing that's been suggested is the Big Mac index. Yeah. I hasten to, uh, to add, I hesitate to suggest that because you were talking about quality. But right. um, <laughs> if we abstract from that. <laughs> it's interesting because you can't even abstract from it within. You know, I mean, it's sort of interesting that um, my colleague Orly Ashenfelter, 
um, gave his presidential address to the American Economic Association on Burgernomics or whatever he calls it, which is, you know, the, the derivatives of the... Um, and he has this wonderful picture he shows, which is McDonald's in India. You know, and there's a cow wandering outside the McDonald's in India. And of course, there's no cow inside the store. The cow is only outside the store. So the issue as is to whether you're really looking at the same thing, you know, because it's really chicken burger <laughs> in there, as opposed to the Big Mac in the US. But I agree. I mean, he uses it not so much to study cost of living. He's more interested in labor markets around the world, where there's a relatively homogeneous process, and you can look at what people get paid in these various things. But I mean, the Big Mac index is very tempting, and it has a mix of things in it, which is, makes it a good index. It's not just meat and bread and you know, sawdust or whatever you say. <laughs> <laughs> tomato ketchup and all those things. But there's labor costs and service and so on. So to some extent, it's a shortcut for the whole economy. But you know, in the end, it's only one item. And there are lots of other things that people eat. And they don't, and not just eat, but they're important parts of their lives. And you know, the prices of iPads don't really behave the same way as the prices of Big Macs. So it's a shortcut thing. It's very tempting. Um, for someone um, like the economist, you know, who can collect this relatively cheaply. Because this enterprise, I don't know what this costs, but you're talking about tens or hundreds of millions of dollars um, to collect these now many millions of prices. Um, there's at least a thousand items. Um, in fact, there are way more than a thousand items um, that are calculated in each that are collected in each of multiple locations in 199 countries. And that, you know, there's a lot of technical work and all the rest of it that goes into this. It's a very, very expensive um, exercise. So these shortcuts, like the Big Mac index, are going to be around for a long time because they're useful. But you can't rely on them to get the full capture of Livingston. There was a question back there? Yeah. Thank you very much for your talk, Professor Ditton. My question is related to the paper by Meyer and Sullivan, uh, where I noticed that poverty rates with and without uh, non-cash benefits were practically the same. And actually, the poverty rate with non-cash benefits was actually higher, which is a bit counterintuitive, perhaps. Um, I think that's to do with where you base it. You see what I mean? So there are different lines in the different bits. But I'm, I'm otherwise not quite sure. I think the big difference there is the is the CPI, but anyway. Yeah, question there, please. It's possible you might get this to this tomorrow. So ultimately, there's a, a PPP number that's computed, and that allows. Uh, prices and poverty ultimately to be compared across different areas. But you talk about like air travel, for instance, uh, if that's included in the cost of PPP. For people that are poor in the UK or poor in Kenya, this seems irrelevant, the, yeah. the cost of air travel. It would seem like you'd focus not on the, uh, the cost of the Brook Brothers shirt, but just that cheap rayon shirt in both countries. Yeah. Is that something that can be calculated from the uh, the pricing information, so you sort of get a new PPP number that's specific to people of certain poor lifestyles. Right, right. That's a great question. And I devoted about five years of my life to trying to answer that question. Um, so I can actually, <laughs> you can see how boring my life is. <laughs> um, and you know, every so often you have to take off and get blindly drunk for about a month, you know, and then <laughs> plunge back into the PPP salt mine to solve questions like that. Um, so there was a lot of criticism of PPPs on that ground, on those grounds that, you know, these were, cons when the pen world table was set up, the idea was to compare GDP around the world. So it was a national accounting exercise. It wasn't really a poverty exercise. So the PPPs were calculated in a way that was like, you know, the general economy, not for poor people. And as you say, poor people have very different budgets than do rich people. So a guy called Olivier Dupier at the World Bank and I spent five years dealing with us. We threw away all the rich countries. We only calculated PPPs for poor countries. 
And we used weights only for poor people in countries around the world. And then, you know, the machine, we did all the coding and assembled all the household surveys, and it really did take five years. And then at the end, the numbers came out and they were almost identical to the ones before. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, after you finish saying, oh, shit, you, know, you, you start sort of thinking and say, you know, how could this possibly be the case? Now, the interesting thing is, if you, one's intuition here is playing tricks on you, or it, I'm not, it played tricks on me too, so we're both in the same boat here. And there are small differences sometimes, but the reason is when you're doing a PPP, you're comparing two countries. Now, the weights, you don't want to use the average, you want to use the weights of poor people down here. So, but the comparison is not between this person and this person, which is a poor and a rich person in each country. It's between poor people and the two countries. So if the relationship between poor and rich people is the same in the two countries, this relationship across here is going to be pretty much the same as this relationship across here. <coughs> and that's what happened. And what's happening is the poor spend a lot more on food than the rich do, and they don't spend much on air travel. But that's the same in all countries. That happens in all countries. And so it changes the price level in both countries. But when you compare the countries, which is what PPPs do, the relativity is about the same. Now, the only places where that's not true is countries that provide very heavy food subsidies, for instance, like India. And um, there is a difference. But it's case, it's, that's where it gets picked up. Um, anyway, yeah. I didn't do nothing else for five years. <laughs> 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 Any question at the very back? Thank you. Sir, considering your wisdom, and uh, you've been exploring this since, age, since d decades, um, is there any possibility for us to lead towards a convergence or reduction of creating the ideal scenario of uh, reducing this, narrowing this gap? And if so, uh, what role would mindset or culture play in that? Because you did mention politics. Yeah. Thank you. So which, tell me which gap you're thinking about. Uh, all right. Uh, from my, I come from a developing country, yeah. uh, third world called Pakistan. Then I yeah. had an opportunity to be in Japan, which is a developed country. Yeah. And then I came to Britain yeah. uh, to study. So I saw a contrast, but I felt as though the mindset played a crucial role in the social behaviors and as a consequence on the economy as well and on the disparity amongst classes yep. and the consequence of which is poverty. Um, poverty of mindset or poverty of wealth. Yep. Um, but from my learnings, I felt as though in Japan, the m mindset and the culture of collectivism played a crucial role in harmonizing this sense of uh, well-being of the community, whereas in Pakistan I saw stark contrast, uh, social divides, yep. um, and then in Britain as well I saw a great deal of individualism and sort of poverty as well of, of a different sort. Right. Well, I think those things are very important. Um, I'm not sure we're going to capture them in price indices. I mean, we might be able to capture them by looking at happiness and well-being around the world, which does cut a much broader swathe and would conceivably take into account some of the issues you're talking about. But that's about all I can offer. It's not been much of a provenance of economists, at least until we moved into these well-being areas. Um, Pakistan, by and large, is a pretty happy place. And um, if you actually measure the amount of happiness yesterday, um, Pakistan does better than Denmark. And in fact, I like to tease my colleague, Peter Singer, and say that if he really wants, to, he's a real utilitarian, and if he wants to make the world a better place, the Pakistanis should be giving aid to the Danes, yeah. <laughs> and not the other way around. <laughs> and every time I see him, I say, have you come up with an answer for that yet? And he says, no, I haven't, actually. Anyway. So, so I think on that, on that note, we should uh, probably draw today's proceedings to a close. It just remains for me to uh, thank Angus very much for a second very stimulating lecture. I look forward to it as well. <laughs>